I'm giving you a dean's welcome tonight, which is to say I have the pleasure of inviting you to a really fabulous, interesting, and important event, and then having to go to a business meeting right afterwards and not getting to hear it myself. So I, I regret that, but I'm delighted uh, that you're here. <coughs> Our division and the Milano School of International Affairs Management and Urban Policy are committed to what I call learning in action, to research and education that engages in significant public issues, that seeks solutions to important public problems through policy and communications and advocacy, and trains our students to be leaders, policymakers, advocates, reflective citizens. Uh, and right at the heart of that educational mission are forums like this one. Uh, part of what we do here at the New School and through the two centers that co-sponsor this, <clears throat> that, co that are co-sponsoring tonight's lecture, is serve as a forum for important public conversation on the most salient and pressing issues of, uh, of the day. The two centers that are co-sponsoring the Schwartz Lecture couldn't be more committed to that kind of public mission of policy making social change and learning in action. One is in our division, the Center for New York City Affairs, which is an applied think tank that combines policy uh, research, advocacy, and communications on a whole range of issues at the heart of life and welfare in New York City. Uh, my colleague, Andrew White, is the director of that uh, center, and, and I thank him for the work that he and his staff are doing. Uh, tonight, we're co-sponsoring, I think for the first time, with the Schwartz Center for uh, Economic Policy Analysis, an economic policy think tank based in our sibling division, the New School for Social uh, Research, which focuses on the role that government can and should play in the productive economy uh, to raise living standards, econ uh, create economic security, and attain full employment. So both centers are exemplars of the kind of publicly engaged research and scholarship and education we aim to do here. I'm proud that we're collaborating uh, together, and I'm delighted to welcome Andy Stern for tonight's lecture. And in order to introduce him and, and the other panelists, I'm going to invite my colleague Andrew White to come up. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased you could all make it. It's a Beautiful day outside, heck of a time to be in a dark room like this, but this is going to be worthwhile. Um, and I also want to um, say hello to all of those who are increasingly watching these events online as we put everything we're doing up on the web. Um, so this event came out of, conver out of conversations that our two research centers, research and policy centers have been having with one another. For the most part, the institute that I lead, the Center for New York City Affairs, focuses on public policies and, the, and their impact on working class and low income families with children. That's not our sole focus, but it encompasses most of our work, including our large projects on child welfare and public education and juvenile justice. And at the same time, the Schwartz Center, and in particular its director, Teresa Gallarducci, have devoted themselves to issues that affect American families at a different point in their life cycles. Teresa is among the leading voices on retirement security in the United States. But here's the thing, none of these issues of social policy and practice exist in isolation. So many of the families that I write about include more than two generations in the home or have grandparents caring for small kids or are otherwise relying on some kind of social welfare benefits to care for their loved ones. And most of us know what it means to be parenting our children while caring for our parents. Um, it seems to me that nearly all social policy leads back to the critical question of how best to achieve income security across a person's entire lifespan and whether government should provide it or not when there's no other apparent option. So looking back very far across most of our history, kids worked at a young age and older people lived in dire poverty because there were really no assurances of anything else, of government support in particular. In the United States, this hasn't been true for decades, at least not for the majority. But as we're going to hear tonight, 
There are very, very serious problems with retirement security for Americans today and more looming on the near horizon. And there's no guarantee or there are no guarantees that people of my generation or future generations will have the kind of stabilizers that others have today, whether it's Medicare or Social Security or something else. It's not entirely clear where American voters stand on all of this. A majority appears willing to accept that people who receive public assistance should not have incomes as high as people who work. But do they also believe that those who work should never live in desperate poverty? Um, in fact, today, low-wage labor is a core component of the New York City economy and of the US economy. So is it foolish of us to believe that even in that context, this country might find a way to provide a higher degree of financial security across the span of a lifetime? So that's our starting point for this evening's talk and for the discussion that will follow. Um, we have a wonderful speaker this evening as well as some excellent commentators to follow. Um, we're gonna do Q&A in the latter part of the session with microphones that staff will carry around to you. You can put up your hands when that time comes. Um, along with the Schwartz Center, we're thrilled to welcome Andy Stern here this evening. Mr. Stern is the former president of the Service Employees International Union He's the founder of Change to Win and currently a senior research fellow at Georgetown University. As the former president of the 2.2 million member SEIU, the largest union in the country representing healthcare, hospital, nursing home, and home care workers, the largest union representing janitors, security officers, and other workers in the building services industries, and one of the largest unions representing public sector employees. Stern, that's a long sentence. <laughs> Stern ramped up the union's labor organizing efforts, he strengthened its role in political action, and he led the SIU out of the AFFL-CIO and into a new federation of unions called Change to Win. Last spring, Stern stepped down as president of the union, and since then he's continued to press forward promoting ideas for new employment policies and other policies in Washington. Tonight we're, we will hear about some of his latest work. So please join me in welcoming Andy Stern to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, let me just say it's quite an honor for me uh, to give the Bernard Schwartz lecture tonight at the New School. For those who don't know Bernard, he actually is one of the few people I could say is a living legend. He's a product of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. He served honorably in World War II, built a number of companies, and then politically and philanthropically, uh, has tried every day to make America a place where people like him, who grew up as a poor kid, still can see their dreams come true. And then Teresa Giladucci, who is here in the front row, many of you know her, she's kind of a perpetual motion machine of ideas and policy, and, and very much coupled with practical engagement. She's the developer of the comprehensive proposal called the Guaranteed Retirement Accounts, uh, featured and celebrated, in fact, in Parade Magazine, the New York Times, and by Vice President Biden's middle class tax force. She's worked closely with John Liu, with unions, with companies, uh, to try to figure out how to wrestle with the challenge of the 21st century for pension plans. So I just want to start off by saying thank you to Teresa, thank you to Bernard. Let's give them a round of applause. So then I always like to say to people like Andrew who give me these very warm and I would say overly generous and effusive introductions, uh, when you've been around as long as I have doing this work, you appreciate uh, all the success I had. It's not about who I am, but it really was about who I represented. Uh, 2.2 million of the most fabulous, hardworking Americans. People like the 100,000 janitors here in the New York metropolitan area who clean the the new school and almost every major apartment building and office building here in the city of New York. The 300,000 home care hospital and nursing home workers, members of SEIU 1199, who take care of our kids uh, at, the tw at the dawn of life and our parents at the twilight of life. All of them who work hard every day uh, to make this country the kind of place that we want it to be and where dreams still come true. So really, in their honor, I want to start off by showing you a little video. You can see somewhat the silhouette here 
Uh, this video is even more secret than the tapes that were found in Osama bin Laden's <laughs> compound. It's going to show President Obama doing things that many of you will be cannot believe he ever did. And I guarantee you that he will never do it again. <laughs> so I want you to walk a day with Pauline Beck, a member of SEIU, and uh, now the President of the United States, Barack Obama. If this works. Did some laundry. I think that he's, the Senate's doing a good job. He act like he know what he's doing anyway. He ended up like doing said, the mopping, the sweeping, and he, he did the laundry. <laughs> She working the hell out of it. He really wanted to do it and told me to forget that I'm the senator. Man. You know, this is All a walk in your shoes. Shoe. So he said, what else you do, do you do? You. Okay. I, I'm ready to work, you know, so. You're ready to work, so. I, I can work while I'm talking. It ain't no standing around. So Where's I, that boom? He wanted to learn about what my needs are, what the shortcomings was, what the pitfalls was in the program, and how he can help. I learned some specific things about the struggles that uh, home care workers are going through. Uh, uh, the priority that Pauline placed on uh, having paid sick leave, uh, I think, is reminds me of how important that is to the workforce as a whole, uh, many of whom are in her position and don't have paid sick leave. You, you all ready? Ready. Okay. Ready to go on that station. There you go. SEIU has made a difference for me. They're my spokesperson. They're my voice. Well, I think it, may, I think it makes all the difference uh, to have a union representing somebody like Pauline. Uh, she described what it was like before uh, SEIU reached out to her. She was getting paid a minimum wage. She didn't have health care benefits. Uh, now, as a consequence of the work that SEIU has done, she's got uh, a wage that uh, pays uh, $10 and, and change an hour. She's got health care, but there's still more work to be done. So not quite the situation room, but uh, maybe a more important event for tonight's purposes in terms of having a president of the United States who actually walked a day in one of our members' shoes. Pauline went on to speak at the Democratic National Convention, which I thought was an important consideration given to her. And she is one of the heroines who go out every day and make everything that I do uh, seem quite easy. You know, people frequently ask me, how did you, a middle-class kid from suburban New Jersey, uh, ever get involved in unions? And because Glenn Beck is, I believe, not here tonight, I think he's safely ensconced in Israel. Um, and so I can tell a little bit more of the truth. Uh, I can tell you that I am a product of the 60s. I did the whole 60 thing. You know, the long hair, the Volkswagen bus, the ticket to Woodstock, taking over the administration building because of the anti-Vietnam War era. Um, I did the whole 60 thing. Uh, fortunately, I did graduate college, but I won't tell you much more about how well I did because for aspiring students, it's not very good story to tell. <laughs> that I will not answer, but yes. <laughs> now, everybody in my family expected me to become a lawyer. And at some point in my life, I realized I actually wanted to spend my life trying to help other people. I, I was rather struck by the words of Franklin Roosevelt, who said, that the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, but it's whether we provide enough for those that have too little. And for 38 years, that's exactly what I tried to do, organize the actions and voices of people that work every day who have too little to give them the strength to get a little bit more. My earliest recollections of unions is not very good. It wasn't an institution I really aspired to be part of. And I can tell you when I got my, as my mother called it, my first real job uh, as a public worker working in the state of Pennsylvania as social services, and I went and saw on the bulletin board a notice uh, that there was a union meeting. It really wasn't a very enticing uh, invitation except for one small thing. They were serving free pizza. And at 22, when you've got your first job and don't have a lot of money and someone's offering you a free meal, I learned my first 
basic lesson about union organizing, never underestimate the value of a free meal. And I went, sat through the meeting, ate my way through, and near the end of the meeting, uh, most of the people had drifted out. It wasn't quite an exciting event. Uh, and the woman staff member of the union came up to me and said, excuse me, what's your name? And I said, Andy Stern, are you new? I said, yes. She walked over and said, and I'll still remember, this was the act of fate that changed my life and whispered into the shop store at Al Actert's name. And Al Actert stood up and with great fanfare said, nomination for the assistant shop store to Levine District Welfare Office, I nominate and elect Andy Stern. <laughs> and here I am. So for all of you who've gone through lots of career planning and wonder whether your major really has a dramatic impact, sometimes fate uh, is really the whole deal. Um, but that became my lifetime uh, of union work. I came to the meeting because of pizza. I stayed for over 38 years because it gave me purpose and principles and a group of people that were rather inspiring. It helped me actually gain a far greater appreciation for this country and really for the people that go to work every day and make it great. So I like to say, I love America. I happen to think America is a gift. And its greatest gift is that people like my grandfather Lewis come here from all over the world. All my grandfather Lewis ever hoped for and expected from America was that he was going to work really hard. What he hoped for was maybe his work would be rewarded. But what my grandfather Lewis and so many other people dream about is that his son Milton, my father, and his grandson Andrew would lead a better life than he did. That is the unique and special American dream. And remarkably, despite a, through, despite a civil war, two world wars, recessions, depressions, natural disasters, 43 different presidents, that dream has endured up until now. 78% of American parents no longer say that their children will do better than they will. That's why we're here tonight. That's not the America we want. It's not the America we need. And it's why we need to not mix the true patriotism we have in our country with a sense of irrational exuberance or an undue belief that America will always be the most exceptional na nation on earth. That is not guaranteed to be true. So to understand where I think we are and what we need to do and what I want to talk about tonight, it's important to understand this moment in history. Our country joined by the rest of the world, is living through the most profound, the most significant, the most transformative economic revolution in the history of the world. Now, it's a lot to say this is the most transformative economic revolution in the history of the world, but it is. There have only been, actually, three economic revolutions in world history. The first, the agricultural revolution, took 3,000 years. The second, the industrial revolution, took 300 years. This revolution... And this is the third economic revolution as we change from a national to an international economy, from muscle work to mine work, from manufacturing to knowledge, bioscience, green, information technology. This revolution will only take 30 years. No single generation of people appreciate where we all are and where we now sit. No single generation of people have ever witnessed this much change in a single lifetime. And this revolution is televised. It's Googleized, it's digitized, it's on your screen, in your face, 24-7. It is relentless, it is unending, and it's far from over. We now know many of the contours that shaped the Third Economic Revolution. When Thomas Friedman first wrote The World Was Flat, a lot of people wondered about his prescription. But it turned out it's true. We now live in a global integrated marketplace with global trade and global labor and capital. And now we just find that all of this is not just affecting negatively blue collar workers in our country, but white collar workers as well. Second, in a global economy, countries may be headquartered in the United States, but they operate without regard for nations. Most of the Fortune 500, Fortune 50 certainly, and most of the Fortune 500 companies now have a majority of their business outside the United States. They salute no flag but their own corporate logo and have no loyalty to any nation. 
And so more and more what it means is we create a global trade, global capital, global finance. And as you begin to hear the discussion, we forgot to create global governments, global regulation, global blank, banks, global institutions to manage a global economy. So today what we're seeing more and more is companies rather than countries make the rules of the global economy. Of the 100 largest economic entities in the world, <laughs> remarkably 51 are companies and only 49 are countries. Third, America now faces its first real economic competitor in the history of, of recent modern history, and that's China. When I first wrote a book called A Country That Works in 2005, I predicted, because it was everyone was saying, that China would be the largest economy in the world by 2035. Three years ago when I gave the speech, I revised that to say 2025. Last week, it was revised to say in the next five years, China will become the largest economy in the world. China has developed a powerful blend of state capitalism and private investment. But yet, they will do anything to succeed in the global economy. When 90% of the software in the government of China is pirated, we understand, despite all trade agreements, despite the WTO, that you appreciate that China has a plan, as President Obama would like to say, to win the future. We just have a slogan in America to win the future. Now, there are many other changes I could discuss, I wrote about, but the bottom line is this for America. In the 21st century, in a global economy, in the third economic revolutions, countries are teams. And Team USA has no plan. The 20th century, market worshiping, privatizing, deregulating, cu tax cutting economy will not work in the 21st century. It's countries like Germany and Singapore and China that have plans of where to invest, where to grow their economy, how to promote trade that are becoming the successful economies. And those of us that are still living in the 20th century are not going to drive into the future looking in the rear view mirror. So what does that all mean? It means that if we don't do something fundamentally different about making a real economic plan, and I'm not talking about a communist five-year plan, but if we don't figure out how to shape and provide direction for this economy and continue to elect allow multinational corporations, and to allow the market to drive us forward, we will not succeed. And the facts, sadly, are proving us out. From 2000 to 2010, we had a jobless decade. We created not one new net job. Today, the private sector, number of private sector jobs in the United States are the same as there were 12 years ago. So all kids coming out of college and all the people we expect to work longer into their 60s and maybe even their 70s if we change Social Security are going to find themselves in an economy with not one new net job in 12 years. We all know that as America is growing apart economically, not growing together, all as a result, I say, of this third economic revolution and the failure of America to have a plan. And we now know that 1% of the population is attributing and gaining almost all the real wage and wealth building in our economy. Despite all the promises that free trade would be the solution for America, multinational corporations in America now employ three million fewer workers than they did just 10 years ago. And the sad thing is, for those who said that college, that education was simply the answer to America's future, the only, that only workers with a doctorate or a professional post graduate degree, which is only 3.6% of college graduates, have seen any real increase in their wages. All other educational cohorts, including college graduates, have suffered declines in real wages. So education being the answer, trade being the answer, the market being the answer is not going to work for America in the 21st century. And sadly, all of this also applies to wage growth, where the median income is the same today as it was in 1997. American workers have now been working for 14 years and have not gotten a raise. So over the entire 20th century, except for the period of the Great Depression and shortly thereafter, the United States had never endured such economic stagnation. That is what we face as a country if we don't come to grips with this particular unique economic moment of history. We are not going to go back to the era of Franklin Roosevelt as much as I admire him. 
I like to say we're as far today from the New Deal as the New Deal was from the Civil War. And while I'm sure Franklin Roosevelt admired Abraham Lincoln, he did not build an industrial economy around 1865. We will not build a global economy around 1935. This is a unique moment of history. Now, the only thing I really kicked myself for in life was that there actually was a solution to all of these problems. You know, for all the people that spend a lot of time, like Teresa, on these very complex economic solutions to very difficult problems, this is a problem that had a very simple answer. You see, if we had indexed the minimum wage to CEO salaries, <laughs> the minimum wage would be $25.10 $25 an hour today, and the average factory worker would make $110,000 a year. So I blew it. So what's to be done? Now, I could quote and Glenn Beck would think I would, a famous communist, <laughs> to answer that question. I would rather uh, quote my more famous Lenin, John Lennon, and say, imagine. Because imagine how this third economic revolution, with all of its technological changes, what it really means. We have the opportunity to do things that no one could have ever dreamed, from, dreamed of, that once were the province of science fiction. We've now taken a billion people in the world and taken them out of a poverty, and that trend line still continues, although not as much, obviously, in our country. Every piece of knowledge that ever existed is now available to every single person in the world. Most of the babies who are born today will live to over 100 years old. We now have an ability to travel globally, something that was once only the province of the wealthy. Healthcare is soon going to be a right, I believe, in this country, not simply a privilege. Democracy is breaking out all over the world. This is not a moment of history where change cannot occur. But it takes a plan. Because there are many known and many yet undiscovered answers to all of the solutions and all of the problems we talked about today. And I just want to end tonight by focusing on one issue, which is the issue of retirement security an issue that, because of the work of the Schwartz Center and Teresa and others, I believe is ripe for solution. In fact, as ripe as any issue I've seen in a long time. So let me just explain where the context for this discussion, the third economic revolution context for this discussion. One, in the 21st century, the one job in a lifetime economy is over. The idea that the employer is going to manage your work life, your pension, your benefits, your training, and then give you a gold watch and say goodbye, that model of a one job at a lifetime employment is over. So any solution has to acknowledge that harsh or new reality. Two is what that means is employees and employers are separating and about to get a divorce. That employers no longer are responsible for you, and as we see more and more as people move amongst employers, people feel far less loyalty to their employer as well. Three is that we are transitioning from employer-managed work lives, like I talked about, to self-managed work lives. And today, nearly 30% of all Americans, over one in four all Americans, are now contingent. They have no full-time employer. Kids entering the workforce, like my son Matt, will have nine to 12 jobs on average by the time he's 35. And if you want to count on your employer for a lifetime career, only one third of the employers, because of the creative destruction that's going on in the economy, only one third of the employers that exist, to, that are here today, will even exist in 25 years. The other three quarters will be gone, merged, or out of business. So even if you want to stay with your employer, your employer is not going to be around to stay with you. So either we're going to fix this retirement security system not on an employer basis, or we're going to find that Social Security, which is really the only guaranteed security that people have in this world as defined benefit pensions begin to erode, uh, is going to be the only major vehicle for change, and that is not sufficient. 50% of all Americans only have Social Security, and most of them are not going to do well as they grow and age under the current system. So let's imagine a 21st century, it is not complicated, retirement security plan, if I can figure out how to get to the slide. 
So first of all, what is an unknown story is that the, the Simpson Bowl Commission, better known as the National Commission, worse known as the better, National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, actually had a recommendation about that. In fact, if you had sat in and listened to the backroom discussion, everybody appreciates that America needs to find a new retirement security plan. The Concord Coalition would even say we need to mandate employers and employees contributing into plans, because if not, from their point of view, as very fiscal conservative organizations, they believe government will end up paying the cost. And the progressives who understand that defined benefit pensions, you know, at best are going to be maintained for the people that have them, but are not the growth part of the retirement security plan, would say we need to move in a different direction as well. So there was an enormous conversation, all of which led to the fact that we need a new national guaranteed retirement security plan above and beyond Social Security. The failures of the current system are pretty simple. This is a chart that Teresa created. And there are four sets of leakages, or three sets of leakages she talks about. One is the fact that contributions today are voluntary. And I'd hate to put to a test what would happen if we made Social Security contributions voluntary. Because most people who are young or middle-aged somehow believe that we're going to save my money in the last 10 years of my life, and then everything will be fine. So voluntary systems we have proven with 401ks and other attempts to try to create wealth have not worked. And the tax breaks in the current system go to the people who don't need them, which are the people that make the most. Two, we have investment leakage. People who have the least pay the highest fees even when they do save money. Tremendous amount of money leaking out of private uh, 401ks and other accounts and fees. And then just people make bad decisions or have bad luck when it comes to investing. Three, we have the leakages of distribution which is basically that too many people take their money out, whatever money they've saved along the way to deal with an emergency, a house, their education, and that money's not there or replaced by the time uh, they get to the end of life. Or when people retire, they take all their money in a lump sum, buy the house, buy the truck, buy the whatever it is, and then home have money when the time comes to live till they're 80 or 90 years old. And all that means we have a system that the risk is way too high, and a 6.6, .6, they say, trillion dollar gap between what is expected that people need and what they actually do have. And that still is a lot of money in America, as much as we throw around billions and trillions these days. Uh, the answer is not particularly complicated either. There's a set of principles that almost all the people in a group that I'm involved with tend to agree. We need a plan that has universal coverage. That's government aid. We should take out the E. Um, that has, uh, we, want that we want that too, uh, that re realigns the tax benefits to the people that need them the most, that require contributions, that is portable. What we really want is what George Bush proposed, which were universal private accounts, but we don't want them paid for by shifting money out of Social Security. But the structure, which was also the structure that Bill Clinton proposed, is actually the right way to do it, to have an add-on account to Social Security, something you take from job to job so you don't end up or live with all these different 401ks that you're trying to remember where they are, how you invested in, how to move the money around as you shift from job to job. So we need universal accounts, realign the tax benefits, uh, mandatory contributions from employee and employers, and then people can add on for your kid's birthday, wedding, whatever it may be to help increase the wealth building. In the investment area, we need to have professional managers. It's proven over and over again that as smart as we all think we are, that professional managers do better than the rest of us. Go look at many of the endowments and other investors. And, and additionally, people who have their money professionally invested have a range of choices in investment vehicles that individuals can never have on their own. Teresa talks about the need for guaranteed accounts in the sense what do what Tia Kreft does, which is guarantee some amount of minimal return on those accounts if they are professionally managed. And then, of course, they should be efficient and have effective oversight. And finally, what we need to remember is the problem with defined contribution plans uh, is you know exactly how much money you have, but you have no idea how to use that money to live out your lifetime. And the problem with defined benefit plans is you have no idea how much they cost, but you actually know exactly how much you get. And so the real trick here is to, to marry defined contributions and defined benefits, 
which is really an answer that Teresa's guaranteed retirement accounts and many other people talk about, and it's not very complicated. You create universal individual accounts, you take individual contributions and employer contributions, you put them in the universal account, you professionally manage them, and at the end of life, you annuitize them. You have an annuity, which is a guaranteed payout, which individuals cannot afford on their own any more than you can buy health care on your own. Don't buy annuities on your own. But the gift of insurance is pooling. And once it's pooled, annuities are exactly all that defined benefit pensions do more professionally and more regularly. But it can be done on an individual basis if it's pooled in a much larger relationship, which is what exactly a federal government should be responsible for helping do. And then again, you end up receiving defined benefits at the end. So that's a solution to retirement. There are solutions to so many of the problems we have in this country that are simple, but they're not a matter of chance. They're a matter of choice. And to date, our country has been unwilling uh, to make those hard choices. So let me just end by saying this. Uh, the futurists, I don't know if you've ever heard of Heidi and Alvin Toffler, wrote about this moment of history by saying, Humanity faces a quantum leap forward. We are engaged, now think about this, we are engaged in building a remarkable new civilization from the ground up. And on my desk is a plaque that says, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And it's time, in fact, it's long overdue, that America builds a new 21st century future where progress is measured not by whether we add as we are today to those who have too much, but whether we do something for people who have too little. That's the America we want. That's the America we need. And may we all have the courage and the wisdom and the fortitude in this very difficult moment of history uh, to have our voices be loud and heard and to set our country in a new direction where the dreams of our children still do come true. Thank you. All right. Um, now I get to introduce our panelists. And uh, Andy, you can sit up there as well. Um, Dan Cantor is executive director of the Working Families Party. For those of you who don't know, New York is fairly unique in that third parties actually matter in a big way here. Um, Cross-endorsing candidates from other parties when possible and exerting influence that way. Dan is a um, former organizer for uh, both political, um, in political work and in labor. He was a community organizer in Texas, Arkansas, and Missouri, and a union organizer in Detroit and New Orleans. Um, and, and created, I believe created the new party before the Working Families Party has been doing this now for at least 12, 13 years, I think, at the Working Families Party. Uh, Teresa Gilarducci is a labor economist here at the New School for Social Research. She is um, director of the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Cent Center for Economic Policy Analysis and the Schwartz Chair in Economic Policy. Um, and our moderator, this evening is Catherine Rampell from the New York Times. Catherine writes about economics and edits the economics blog, that's economics with an X, for the New York Times. Before joining the Times, she wrote for the Washington Post editorial pages and the financial section and for the Chronicle of Higher Education. And she's also written for several other magazines and, and websites, Slate, Smithsonian, The Voice, and many others. Catherine. I'm significantly shorter than the other people who have been up here, so <laughs> readjusting. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I am here to feed questions, moderate, and then um, we'll be taking questions from people in the audience. Um, and I wanted to start out talking a little bit about businesses' interest in a lot of these issues, since we don't actually have someone represented from um, the corporate sector here. So um, higher labor costs, whether, they're, whether we're talking about minimum wage or um, higher or better health care benefits or retirement benefits for that matter, you know, obviously um, are not good for companies, um, or at least they perceive it that way. And 
may and are likely actually encouraging more companies to move more of their positions abroad. You know, there are already other pressures to do this, but where labor is cheaper, they're more likely to go there. So I'm curious um, what the responsibilities of labor supporters are to make conditions in the states, New York specifically or elsewhere, more business friendly to try to keep more jobs here. Because that's me. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's an old, it's like, got to rotate the question a little bit here. Uh, there used to be this notion of Fordism. Uh, this was the idea that workers would be paid enough to actually be able to buy the products they were making. This was Henry Ford's great, great contribution uh, at some level uh, to American political economy. And the great American middle class in some ways was built, really built by two things. One, on the one hand, by uh, labor unions pushing up and high marginal tax rates pushing down. Uh, labor unions guaranteed that people would share, regular people would share in the productivity gains over the long boom uh, after World War II, and high marginal tax rates reduced the, uh, the value of being a, you know, a thief. Uh, you, there was, you know, when there was 91% uh, marginal tax rate, there wasn't much of an incentive uh, to, to, to uh, you know, ha pay yourself an immense salary because you had to give it back. So now we, Fordism is, seemingly gone. Uh, it's been replaced in a sense by Walmartism. Pay people barely enough to shop at the store they, they work at. So uh, I guess I'd say uh, that's a terrible picture you're painting. That's a race to the bottom. Uh, we don't want that. We want, and there are plenty of employers who realize this. We're working with contractors and some weatherization stuff who want to travel the high road. They don't want to be undercut by low wage competitors. So you have two choices, right? You either raise the floor uh, or you have a race to the bottom. We, we favor using public power, state power, uh, to reward employers uh, who, who want to travel the high road. Uh, obviously investing, these are, ob you know, these are a little bit cliches, but investing in paving that road, right? In, in the education and all the sorts of training that goes into, uh, into creating a productive society. It's not that, the, that we're in a poor country. Country is rich. We, we happen to live in the richest city in the history of the world, right? It's just the most unequal city. Um, the numbers are boring, but worth noting: one percent of the income in New York City, one percent of the people get forty-five percent of the income in New York City. That's not a healthy situation. So I would say, business leaders who believe that they're just wrong, and we need to figure out a way to either persuade them of, of that their views will lead to a society that is no good for anybody, uh, at, or uh, we need to use, uh, if not the power of persuasion, as somebody once said, but the persuasion of power. Andy, did, did you want to weigh in I mean, on this? I mean, I would say, you know, we have a structural problem in this country compared to other countries in the world because we place the burden about health care, pensions, and many other things on employers. And so that becomes a competitive either advantage or, as you're talking about, disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, one is I don't think you can compete in a global economy where some group of employers in our country have the cost of health care and pension in the, in the cost of the product, and other countries around the world don't. So, you know, the employer-based health care and pension system should end, even though employers don't necessarily want to end it because it's just a non-competitive U.S. practice that makes it even more difficult to do. You know, and, and additionally, I think, you know, we have a really silly tax system, you know, where every other country in the world because of the WTO is allowed to have bad taxes, which really uh, tax imports and allow exports uh, freer, freer movement. You know, we have the worst situation because we, you know, tax ourselves and don't give any advantage to our, and get our exports taxed in other countries. So I just think there are a series of structural things. And then if we were just talking about wages, I, I, what I like to say about the new 21st century is, you know, workers are very used to sharing in the pain. You know, when things go really bad, we really take it. You know, we lose our health benefits, we work part-time. But when things go really well, we don't share in the gain. And we need a different uh, relationship with employers that we get as much on the upside as we do on the downside. What's the mechanism for that? I think there are lots, you know, there's everything, you know, we give a, a tax advantage to employee ownership. We do, do, I mean, business people know a lot about success fees, profit sharing, gain sharing, you know, many, many compensation to people in the city is based upon, you know, certain uh, 
goal orientations that give rewards that there's no reason that can't be done with workers too. And Andy, wouldn't you argue also for a sort of norms that say this kind of level of gross inequality just needs to be not so accepted? And that, you know, it used to be the head of, what did the head of General Motors make in 1952? Like, you know, I don't know, $800,000. So it's not the same as making, it's not just inflation that has, that has created these enormous, enormous uh, private fortunes. There's this concept, if you read, you know, there are these magazines for really wealthy people. My favorite concept in these is you want to have eternal wealth. So that no one who's ever related to you for the rest we'll of history to work. will ever have to. What a goal. It's like, yeah. you know, I, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time trying to fleece rich people for money. It's like the health that their children always suffer from it. The best one, it's the, what you really want to be is upper middle class. That's really your goal in life, in my opinion. Comfortable enough, mm -hmm. but not uh, crazed. I'd just like to add my two cents from the um, economist wing on this question. Um, your, your question, you know, suggests, look at this, the growth in this country. Um, we've done really well. Uh, um, businesses have articulated that they can't actually afford higher taxes or anything else that would burden them. And in fact, they've threatened the capital strike, that if you make me pay my workers or my, my taxes, I, I can strike and I can go someplace else. So that sort of begs the question, do you have to have economic growth and inequality happen at the same time? Is that just the price you pay? for a growing economy. So we've looked at this, economists have looked at this over time in our country that Dan and, and Andy pointed out that we've had the biggest growth in our country when um, income and wealth inequality was much less than it is now. And you look across all countries over time and we really see a very strong correlation with more equal distribution of wealth and income and economic growth. That is, that's another way to say that the inequality we have in this country and our economic growth is just not sustainable. And there's a couple of reasons um, for that. Um, if you have 1%, have 45% of the income and wealth, then the whole production of the economy gets skewed to what they want. So you have these very refined kind of luxury goods um, produced and you don't have middle class um, goods produced. And that's a recipe for slow, slow growth this very, you know, you know, very delicate and precious kind of consumption. You know, how to tweak the yacht or the, the private jet, and that does not add to a broad-based economic growth. And Robert Frank, who writes for the New York Times, you know, on Sunday and is one of my favorite economists, um, tells that tale with another story, which is imagine two cities. In fact, he found two cities. One city taxed their, um, um, their citizens, and they had huge, big public parks and really the finest public schools. And the houses were relatively small. Um, another city had no taxes. They, you know, they um, formed outside of the city center, um, very shriveled up public schools, um, elaborate private schools, big backyards, you know, no public um, space at all. And the city with the smaller houses and the smaller private consumption actually grew. Um, and the, the city with the, with the backyards as big as small public parks um, didn't, stagnated, and people lived alone in these big houses. So that's one way to, to talk about the choices that we have. And, and overall, I think the, the consensus from the economic profession is that you'll get sustainable growth with a more equal distribution of income and higher taxes. Just to be a little provocative, yeah. Uh, of course. Oh, oh, you, Andy? <laughs> no, because someone said earlier to the moderator that uh, I was the, the conservative member of the panel. <laughs> um, so I would just say we've spent a lot of time focusing on the ceiling, and, and I'm actually more interested in focusing on the floor, because mm -hmm. the floor in America is way too low. Right. If you look around the world at how European and other countries deal with things, they've made a different set of choices you know, to have a much higher floor as it relates to wages and benefits and training and childcare. And I feel like we're spending a lot of time appropriately pointing out where the problem is, but not enough time articulating the floor is really the problem. Because honestly, if people were making decent wages, they had health care, child care, their right. kids could go to college, people can make as much money as they want on top yeah. of that. I'm worried about the floor, not the ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the one issue that comes up a lot when I talk with economists is is this idea of is it a fixed pie or is it a growing pie? And it sounds like 
you're talking about the idea of more of a growing pie, that yeah. it's not a zero-sum game if you have the very top people earning more money necessarily. You can have the very bottom percentiles earning more and the top people earning more and if the, if the pie is growing. But otherwise, if it's a fixed pie, then that's not the case. But um, in any case, um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, some proposals for Social Security. Um, so a lot of the discussion so far in Washington about how to reform our retirement system has been focusing on Social Security. There have been proposals for raising the retirement age, for um, having means-tested benefits or more means-tested benefits, um, raising the wage cap, all sorts of different things. Um, but obviously there are, and, and, and another proposal is just to do nothing, which is you know what Washington often does with, with big, hairy questions like this. Um, but there are also discussions about creating some sort of um, complementary system like what Teresa has talked about. Um, and uh, this question is mostly aimed for Teresa, but you know the others of you can weigh in as well. I I'm curious about what comes first, you know, a fix for Social Security um, or a new retirement system? Can you do both? Um, how does that play out sort of in the ideal economist's world versus politically? Yeah, sure. Um, um, so if we didn't have political constraints and we were just creating a, a system that, that really made sense, um, you'd have to have a system where you had both improvements in Social Security and you had the, um, a tier of support um, above Social Security improve. Um, I hope that we all leave here with, um, by, by banishing this model of a three-stool um, system for retirement. Three-legged three -legged, stool. Three -legged, sorry, three-legged stool. Yeah, that would be a bad, a bad metaphor, too. A three-legged <laughs> stool. Um, because that's never been our system, and it's not a system anywhere else. It's really a pyramid, where the base of your retirement security is Social Security, the middle layer is employer pensions, and on top of that, just think of the food pyramid where you have your bourbon and chocolate right there at the top. <laughs> you know, our, 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 private, you know our, our private assets or personal savings. It's that middle tier of employer um, pensions that is really eroding. Um, the Social Security system can be fixed actually with very modest um, proposals that can be paid for over time. We haven't had a raise in the Social Security tax rate for now over, over 19 years, and that's the longest stretch we've ever gone without a, a, a slight increase in the payroll tax. Um, so we just increase that in payroll fact, tax. In fact, we've had a decrease. Yeah. And, and we had a decrease this year. year. Sure. You know, um, um, even though the money is still going in. So we can um, modestly raise that payroll tax. Uh, my, my opinion as an economist, that will not discourage job, job growth. At some higher level, we might, but not at that level. And then we have to pay attention to the erosion of that middle tier of retirement support. 50% of people are working without any additional way to save um, for retirement. And most of them, um, uh, most of them are now getting are now getting access to these 401k type plans, which aren't a good retirement system. We can talk about that later, but they just don't help people accumulate. They, um, investment fees are way too high. People are responsible for decisions that, they, that other people can make much better as investment decisions, and they're much more exposed to financial risk than, than they should. Um, so, we, so to answer your question in closing, in closing is that we really need both, and raising the retirement age um, is one of the worst ideas um, um, in Washington. One of the worst ideas. Because? Okay, because, mm -hmm. thanks for the, for the encouragement, um, for three reasons. <laughs> um, raising the retirement age really presumes that people have a choice about whether or not they work longer. And my research and others have shown that most people retire earlier than they want to. There's a rampant amount of, of age discrimination out there, and there's lots of uh, reasons why people can't work more than 38 to, to, to 40 years. Employers do want um, younger, um, younger members. There is a, a, a group of workers who do get to choose to work longer. Um, they're white collar, really well educated workers. They have control over the pace and content of their work. And it's a good American value that we have laws against age discrimination. Those people, unfortunately, are the ones that are also making the policy decisions for people to, to work longer. So they feel healthier, they feel satisfied by their job, their senators, um, congressmen, even presidents, and policymakers and professors, um, but it does not reflect the reality of most people's um, lives. The second uh, reason 
um, that retirement age, raising retirement age is a bad idea. Is it's also based on the myth that people are living longer. And in fact, longevity improvements are, have really been biased toward um, people with higher income, men um, in higher income levels with higher education are actually getting the best gains in longevity. They stop smoking and they take their Lipitor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and their jobs are frankly more, more satisfying. So longevity increases are, are, not increases are not improving. And third, it's based on this myth that jobs are getting easier. That it's true that most of us are not bending and stooping and carrying and lifting like we um, used to but jobs increasingly are requiring intense con concentration and keen eyesight and multitasking. And these are things that aren't just well matched to, to aging folks. And if I could add a fourth, and I really am very proud of this research and like this research, and everybody who works for a living knows this research. I didn't have to like, prove the obvious, is that people do like to have free time and especially at the end of their lives to create a kind of a narrative, a personal narrative about what their life means, and that time is very precious for them. And in fact, we show in the epidemiological research and the, the health research that most people actually get a little healthier when they can retire. They, they spend time with their friends and their family, they eat better, they sleep better, they do more exercise. And the gains in health um, are especially evident for women where their mental health really Im improves. And men's health um, really improves in the fact it doesn't deteriorate as, as fast. So if we want, and this is what I you know, talked to both of my friends here, if we talk about actually improving living standards for all American workers, we have to include that precious amount of time at the end of people's lives. So that should be equally distributed and not go back when only the rich could retire. Yeah. Well yes. We should run you for something. I, I want to ask Andy, uh, on the question of the floor, which I strongly support, uh, is it just the destruction of unions that has lowered the, made the floor not keep up? What, what, what else are we doing to, or what could we do to sort of remake the case for? Well, there's the only, floor? I mean, there's only three ways we've ever had in this country to sort of sh share in success, you know, make work pay. We had the market, which worked a lot better in a national economy than a global economy because a lot of the competition, the money stayed in the, this system. It didn't leak out into China or anywhere else. We had unions. Ben Bernanke says 25% of the inequality in the country is caused by the lack of market, labor market power. Uh, and the third thing was the government. And the government, as we now see, is a fickle partner. Some days it works really well, and some days it works. Uh, so to me, you know, just like Social Security, we have to embed national standards at a higher level, that we can't do this workplace by workplace alone. I mean, the differentiations right. can be done in wages, but there just has to be a basic floor. Kids should not come out of college with hundred to $200,000 worth of loans. We should not um, you know, have people who have to not have health care or not have retirement. We should just sort of take some of those off the, um, the competitive agenda and then just have you know the wage situation, which is complicated, you know about how you, you know how you set wages in a in a whole series of different jobs. But I just think we have to embed it and then keep it. Well, you mentioned uh, today's youth and student loan debt and so on, and I know that this is about old people, but I I did actually want to talk about young people for a minute who will one day be old, um, hopefully. Um, <laughs> And I'm curious what the retirement security shortfalls of you know, today's baby boomers mean for their kids, um, both in terms of what kind of burden they'll have in supporting their parents or grandparents or ho however family structures continue to evolve, and also in terms of what kind of social services will be available to people, say, of my generation, um, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, if the government is basically charged with spending so much money on supporting elderly people who have this shortfall of retirement savings? Mm -hmm. That's you, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, the, um, the early boomers, these are the folks that are now, these like 30 million people who are starting to now um, turn 65. Um, they are, they have about, they're the last gasp of having a retirement income security that's going to be better than their parents and their grandparents. Um, but we predict that they're going to spend all of their money. 
um, that there is just not going to be what we call in the trade um, accidental bequest, that a lot of people now <laughs> in the audience uh, are benefiting like from inheritances mm -hmm. that have been um, accidentally left to you by your generous parents, mm -hmm. or, or will be left by your generous parents, because they just didn't consume it fast enough. They hoarded it, um, they wanted to make sure that their money didn't run out and they died before they could spend it all. Um, these, this group that's now entering on their retirement years are just not going to have enough money left over. They're not going to have any accidental um, bequests. They might have intentional bequests and be able to have enough to leave it um, and pay off some of those student loans. But these late boomers, um, the folks that actually were born at the peak of the baby boom in the 1950s, are about 50 now, um, we are predicting that they are going to fall short um, by about half of what they need for retirement. So there's going to be no ability there to actually help pay off their, the, their kids' um, student loans. So that means that we're going to have to really pay attention to that, to the, the undercapitalized um, younger population. I hope I, I answered your question. Either wow. of you want to weigh in? I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of stunning to hear it laid out so trenchantly. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm exact, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one of those yeah, who got an accidental good. bequest, but not enough of one. Yeah, uh, and you're not and I'm leave definitely one. not leaving one. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's like right. my life on stage. Um, mm -hmm. But there, I mean, the, the politics of this is really scary because the, 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 there's kind of a steady diet. You're not going to get Social Security is what you yeah. constantly hear. It's like drives you crazy, I'm sure, because yeah. it's, it's, it's right. quite phony. I mean, Social Security yeah. system is not broken, right? It's right. not broke. Uh, it no doubt needs attention, any engine does, yeah, yeah, um, but uh, it's scary to figure out how do you change this conversation from one in which we think we're uh, poor and the only thing we can do is make sure that we don't have capital strike and we have to make, uh, you know, these hedge fund guys, I mean in New York anyway, it's just bizarre how much solicitude there is towards people who you know, there's, I think there's 25,000 taxpayers in New York City who earn more than $40,000 a week. And there's like 2 million, <laughs> there's 2 million that earn less than $20,000 a year. That's so amazing. it kind of, what do you do about that? I, I, we got to raise the floor, but we, we also got to share a little bit more somehow. I don't exactly know how to do all that, but my gut says we're going to have a bad, a bad outcome here if we don't. A bad out outcome economically, politically? I just think the society will just fracture, right? You really, either you believe, I mean, it's a cliche, but it's one, you think you're on your own and you're, you make it because you worked hard or you believe that we, you, know, you actually want to do unto others as you would have done unto you. It's the golden rule political party. Uh, it's, it's not, That's so not how I capitalism just, works, though. I mean, there's, <laughs> it's, it's not about altruism. I mean, no, no, that's why you have very rules. few companies make a lot of money by yeah, right. by being altruistic, mm -hmm. you know, especially if their competitors are not. Right. That's why you have to raise the floor. You uh -huh. have to have rules and regulations that that stop people from competing right. by sweating labor, as we they used to say, and, and uh, not providing health care so that the employer who is providing health care is at a competitive disadvantage, mm -hmm. which is beyond stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Andy, I have a, a question that's specifically targeted at you. So, you know, you mentioned that you were on the Simpson-Bowles Commission. <laughs> and um, the impression amongst those of us in the press and other, other people I know who sort of follow what you do is that you were prepared to vote in favor of sending the Simpson-Bowles Commission to Congress. You were, you were going to endorse it but then had a change of heart. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you voted against it. Um, I mean, there, there are a million reasons that were easy to vote against it, because my, my basic theory is that if we don't solve this problem, it, it is getting solved, unfortunately, and the people that pay are poor people, workers, and students. It's not as if we haven't solved the California problem, look at the tuition. I'll tell you, lots of our members who've had furlough days or... Yeah. So the problem of not solving the problem is not a solution because someone's going to pay the price and it's not the people we think should pay the price. So I'm really not into just, you know, looking at every bad idea and saying that's a bad idea. They're all bad ideas, but there's no really easy idea out of here that politically works. So I'm inclined to be for a solution. 
And I'm appreciative that I get the luxury to now criticize everybody's solution because I don't have any responsibility anymore. But I do think this is a big problem. I, I don't think running up $1.2 trillion debts in the middle of a jobless economy economy and not seeing economic growth post, so to speak, the collapse yeah. is very good for our future. So I was inclined from the very beginning to vote for something or have Congress make some decision because I think the implications, the, the, the problem of not making a decision we're seeing in John Boehner's speech this week, you know, no revenue, all cuts. So. Mm -hmm. I was very disappointed that some of my Republican colleagues, who are the loudest voices in America for uh, fiscal responsibility, Dave Camp, Paul Ryan, who were very, very, very thoughtful people in the commission, I would say, and continue to be thoughtful, except they just had a different thought after no the November election. And the thought was, I'm going to be in charge, and I get to make the rules. So even though I've been pushing everybody on this commission, we have to solve this problem, it's critical, it's important. And so, you know, at the end I felt like, well, there were a lot of things I didn't like, and particularly I didn't like that A, two things besides Social Security. Uh, one was that we asked no corporations to pay one more dime. Every single discussion about corporate reform was about revenue neutral, which seems insane when they are the people who have the greatest amount of income at this moment in history that we're, and two is that we had no money for investment because I don't think we can cut our way out of this. And you know, I like to say PAYGO is the essence of stupidity because it says that in order to garner capital for investment, you have to screw somebody else. So all of Washington looks around and says, I want to build a broadband. And it's like, okay, let's cut welfare. <laughs> and then we start a big fight because we don't set aside 5% of our income to invest in our future. And Simpson Bowles really had no orientation towards, you know, investment, so that uh, concerned me. But what really concerned me the most was in the end, you know, if we were all going to take a, take a uh, tough decision to send it to be voted on, that was fine, but I didn't appreciate that certain people at the end got to be heroes and the rest of us were supposed to be responsible, particularly the ones who've been promoting all of these ideas throughout the debate. Well, so, and, it, and it's not just the federal government that has budget issues, obviously. State and local governments are something else that I wanted to talk about, mm -hmm. um, many of which are severely um, cash-strapped right now um, and will be for some time. And obviously, um, public pensions have been very much in the news because so many of them are underfunded and um, are really underfunded as a result of the crisis. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to hear what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, in a minute or less, how to solve the issue. Um, you know, who, who needs to take a haircut here? Are we talking about cutting benefits for um, existing retirees, soon to be retirees? Um, are they the ones who, need, who should be suffering? Or is it taxpayers? I mean, I'm not really sure that there's really any other party here since, since states can't, for the most part, can't run deficits. Um, okay, one minute. Oh, less than one minute. No, you know, it doesn't actually have to be less than one minute. No, no, I, I, I speak too long. Um, so you were right, you're right, Catherine. If you look um, all across the country, most of the uh, public pension systems are in trouble because they were responsible. It's one of the few functions of government that's advance funded. We don't advance fund our police department, our fire department, you know, our judicial system. Um, we put money set aside because we knew there was going to be a liability out there, just like we do in the police department or the parks. But for this one um, function of government, we advance funded it. And it depended upon what the, uh, what the financial market is. And so over half of the, of the um, shortfall in the city of New York, for instance, is just because of the drop in the financial markets. Um, over 70% of the total nation is because of the drop in the financial markets. So you're right there. It isn't because public pensions, you know, um, benefits have like soared above everybody else. They stay kind of even, but at that, but the market really collapsed. So, But they were underfunded even before the crisis. Many of them were. So Illinois, there's a, you know, a handful of Illinois, just funded about Rhode Island, were underfunded. But they were underfunded for about 40 years. So think of this, if your car ran at 25% empty, but had been running for 40 years, is that really the right indicator? You know, it was a partially pay-as-you-go. You don't have to have full, that's just the wrong indicator. What's really important is that you don't have these big fluctuations. 
So it's really important to have a system of funding and payout that is a smooth, a smooth funding. That's not technical. It really is just um, common sense. Now, but you asked this really hard, hard hitting question. Should retirees take cuts? Absolutely not. They're the really vulnerable. They don't have, they don't have over, you know, most of the pensions are like average of 20% a year. Or there are some police chiefs or city managers that spiked up their, their pension at the last minute are now making more when they were retired than they're not. Absolutely, that should just stop. You know, that spiking is a ridiculous, you shouldn't have more when you retire than you were when you So is that something that should be changed retroactively? Um, I mean, there, there are I people do, who have already retired uh, who are... I, I, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing sacred about the fact that they're retirees. If there were, it, circumstance by circumstance, absolutely, I can imagine a system that would uh, pull back some of those benefits. It won't do very much, but it might give some sense of equity. Is it just not the solution, but it's, but it's, it, 99% of retirees should not take a haircut. But, but every, there's 173 public pension systems and they have 173 problems and 173 solutions. But most of the time it can be solved by waiting for the market to come back, kind of amortizing those losses over time. There's lots of things that we can do without taking away pensions from the people that have them in order to make them just as bad off as everybody else. It's just a wrong way to think about how to solve solutions. So the city of New York, for instance, is actually talking about ways to actually raise up retirement security for all New Yorkers, and maybe That's using right. some of the aspects of the public pension system to help them, them do that. I've seen part of my Lauren Schmidt here is working with me on that, that project, um, and I think that's going to be spread all over the, the, the country, mm -hmm. is that we're going to look at these public pension systems that are actually work pretty well um, to actually help all citizens get pensions. Well, are these, um, are these systems that help future retirees? I mean, how... Does this deal with the fact yeah. that we already have a lot of these people who are retired yeah. and, and, and oh, need benefits? It, these, those are actually the solutions to help all future retirees, which are another word for them, the workers. Uh, the workers, <laughs> yes. Workers that, you know, accumulate assets, you know, reduce their debt and accumulate assets. Mm -hmm. it's know, a gigantic, my minute is over. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gigantic political challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the attack, this is hardly a new thought, the attack on having destroyed the private sector labor movement, you know, Wall Street is and, and their allies and the right generally are trying to destroy the, the public sector labor movement, which is in many ways its own worst enemy. Uh, Got to figure out how to, and it's, there's a lot of jealousy out there. The 78% number that Andy cited in the beginning about people thinking their lives are not, their children's lives are not going to be better than their own. Uh, it's, is a very scary thought because then you end up with a society in which it used to be you look at someone, you, you know, they have something you don't have, you go to your boss and say, I want that too. Now you look at that, they have something I don't have, I'm never going to get that, they shouldn't have it either, right? It's sort of a, a, a lot of momentum headed in, in a very bad direction. Again, you got to raise the floor, these, you know, the DMV clerk with their $18,000 a year pension, this is not what caused the financial crisis in America, uh, despite the uh, claims on Glenn Beck or elsewhere. Uh, on the other hand, there is this, uh, you, you can't, uh, oh, and then you have, uh, you know, Christie or Governor Walker, you know, the, they're the haves and the have-nots, and the haves are public workers with, <laughs> with uh, you know, pensions. It's sort of mind-blowing, but they're saying it, and it's resonating politically, and uh, this is, there's got to be some sort of, it makes me nervous when you say it's got to be federal, right? Because we, there's more, our side has a little more traction at the state level sometimes than at the federal level. So I'm worried about how we make these reforms to raise the floor when there's, when we do it in one state and they say, ah, oh, you can't do it here because on the other state we'll compete just the way countries compete. So these are big problems, but I would say you, unless you align the interests of private sector workers with public sector workers, we're going to have a terrible, terrible time, which I think is what Teresa wants so to say. So I would just add that we need to appreciate the five benefit pensions are a legacy phenomena. There's not been one new defined benefit pension plan created in the last five years, except for, for reasons I have no idea, Methodist ministers created a defined benefit pension plan. I'm sure God had something to do with giving them instructions. I'm sure it's very generous, too. Very generous. So we have an, inst we have an entity that is not the future. Right. We have lots of people who are owed respect and protection for what they were promised, and we should never let that down. And we have different ones that define benefit will last 
different yeah. amount of time depending yeah. upon yeah. the math, right? Yeah. How were they 100% funded? Were they overfunded? Were they, you know, have better benefit design, worse benefit design? But all of them are kind of legacy institutions. So in a perfect world, which we don't have, um, you know, someone would buy out all mm -hmm. the existing pension plans, just like we bought out Wall Street and people to get from the past to the future. Mm -hmm. So everybody who started work mm -hmm. and was made a promise gets taken care of, however that's funded. Mm -hmm. And then we would start new okay. systems for new hires that got us to the American system we really want to have, mm -hmm. you know, which is what Teresa mm -hmm. has been writing about and others, you know. It's just a conversation no one really wants to have because right. it would cost a lot of money even though if you amortize it over a long period of time, it's probably not in the scheme of things. But, you know, I just keep feeling like America can't get to the future. You know, we just keep going like the good old days are going to come back again. And, and this is a revolution. It is not the agricultural revolution. Agriculture did not come back. You know, it had a role. Defined benefits will have a role. <laughs> Lots of things will have a role. They are not the future anymore. Thanks. Um, so one thing that I write about frequently and that I think about a lot is um, the uh, huge number of workers who have been unemployed for over six months, the so-called long-term unemployed. Um, these are people who um, are generally older. Um, even though the unemployment rate is much higher for young people, for teenagers, people yeah. in their 20s, once older people, uh, older workers, you know, I'm defined loosely as like workers over 50, over 55, um, once they lose their jobs, they have a terrible time finding uh, re-employment. And mm -hmm. for right. lots of reasons that are hard to disentangle, some of it, um, well, I always hear from, from unemployed older workers that I talk with that it's age discrimination. I'm sure that it's a combination of other things like, the industries they were employed in um, were um, on the sort of on a structural decline, or and their skill sets are just not needed anymore, or at least are very hard to allocate. Um, and I wanted to hear the, this group's thoughts on what to do about these people. Many of these many of these workers um, who are looking for work and unable to find and are unable to find it have found that. Um, to the extent that their house was their nest egg, they no longer have much in the way of savings. Um, like I said, some of them might be structurally displaced. Um, it seems very unlikely that any major uh, additional stimulus would come from Washington. But I, I just don't, I, I'm always trying to figure out, you know, what smart people from all over the political spectrum are thinking about this particular group of workers. Someone should ask some of them what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, um, can I just say one thing, yeah. though? Sure. This is exactly the reason we should not raise the Social Security age. Right. Thank you. You know, right. it, it, there is this myth that, you know, in the future, we will need more workers, right? And the truth is, I don't see it. I don't believe it. I don't understand it. And I think some people are going to come out with some pretty convincing studies very shortly that says it's not true by very reputable sources. So... This idea that, oh, let's raise the retirement age because everybody just work a couple more years, A, doesn't match one reality, and B, doesn't match the second fact, is that people want to hire younger people over older people, whether they're discriminating intentionally or consciously or not. So we shouldn't raise the Social Security age at all. You know, two is you have to, as a country, at times decide in transitional moments mm -hmm. to take care of people. You know, we had the Trade Adjustment Act that didn't work well, but it was supposed to take care of people yeah. who were affected yeah. by trade. You know, we have That's now right. moving from a national to a global economy, from muscle work to mine work, however you want to call it. A lot of these people are more muscle workers than mind workers. And I just think as a country, you know, this is why you have a government. This is why, I hate to say, people don't like to hear it, you redistribute. A national government redistributes the wealth to try to take care of social problems. You know, our problem in America is, you know, we are going to be, I wrote this article on Valentine's Day called From Russia with Love. You know, we, the one thing we excel at is military spending. You know, we spend as much as the rest of the world combined. We spend three times more than our alleged uh, adversaries, China, North Korea, Iran, you know, Venezuela and whomever. Part of our problem is our biggest export product is arms and military technology. It is our jobs program. Unfortunately, 
in America too. You know, if you look at how the distribution of the suppliers and everyone else, you know, it's very politically oriented to be in every major congressional district. So we built an economy where our military spending is our major, you know, high wage, good jobs in America. And so once we start dealing with them, and which is why you need, every institution needs a transition plan. And we don't, and we have way too much money. And Russia learned, you know, Gates and Mullen both say that our deficit is our greatest national security threat, but they're not contributing to the solution at all, due respect uh, to the words that they're saying, because they're not making really radical changes in how we spend, you know, Gates is re, re well, so, what, so what do we do with all of these, you know, over 50 unemployed workers? We, we have them work, you know, building missiles or? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I have a, I have a story. Um, Andy talked about Russia, I'll talk about Detroit. Um, Detroit, it, it, it's right, I'm really glad you're working on that, Catherine, and I hope that you continue to work on that in, in the New York Times. Um, the fate of people over 50 now is, is, is um, worse than it's ever been before, because this recession is very different than ever before. It might be one, one period, what Andy called just a really transition moment. And in Detroit, because of the strong union um, presence and because of the state of Michigan's policies, we have a, a, um, a, a society called Detroit, metro area, that is actually letting these older workers go into gentle, productive retirement. And they do it with a lot, a set of institutions. Um, in Detroit, um, we have actually a pseudo Medicare plan for many of these workers who are are unemployed. They have a, um, a Medicare system, a Medicaid system that is directed towards older workers, and the um, the auto plants and the auto part plants have a retiree health plan for unemployed um, people. Uh, funded by the auto companies through the contract of the, of the UAW. These are called the retiree health benefits. And most of that money goes to people over 50 to 65, pre-Medicare age. But what is the magic of this gentle um, support, financial support into early retirement or re pre-65 retirement is a vibrant um, economy built on a very uh, advanced healthcare system. So we actually, um, let these workers go into retirement, and they're doing lots of interesting things. They're, they're productive uh, retirees. These are very skilled workers, um, and they have a lot of activities going on. But they also are helping fund a health care sector in Michigan and Detroit that's thriving. So we could actually look at aging cities and aging economies if these workers are properly uh, funded to be a source of growth. Well, so who's, sorry, who's paying the wages yeah. in uh, this gentle, productive, right. well, pre-retirement? Okay, um, well, these are, um, um, they're, not, they're not working. They're, they are retired because they're not going to be re-employed and, they, and they're not going to um, go to Florida or anywhere else. They're in Detroit, they're, like we are in America, the, the workers that you talk about. So they are actually in retirement. They're not, no longer unemployed, and they have health benefits from these retiree health care trusts that came from negotiations between the UAW, GM, Chrysler, and Ford. And um, these companies have reorganized famously with help from the government. And those companies are focused on younger people and younger workers. They're building an electric car there. Um, their educational systems aren't, aren't defunded. So they're setting aside, they're not making these workers work until 70. It's a complicated story. But, you, but, they're, but you're they're talking not, about they're not getting paid. I don't think they're not, they're not, so getting, they're, they're not getting paid. So they're, they're basically retired. retired at they're 50? getting pensions from from their work, from their pension plans, and they're getting retiree health care. That's mm -hmm. right. They're um, not getting social but, security yet, but they're. But, know, but there's a bridge. They will. Yeah. So that's they're not getting Medicare yet. But I mean, it just it doesn't bridge. seem to me that that is a scalable program. You can't. You know, oh, all, all, so, you can't take millions of people yeah. who are in their fifties who still can and want to work and just say. Retire, you yeah. know, the labor so, force doesn't want you. Yeah, I mean, it's a yeah, we got lots of gigantic problems. This is another one. You've done uh, some terrific reporting on this. You know, we should be looking at maybe some things from other countries, German work share stuff, try to, re you know, try to have people work fewer hours, but still have some. I have no idea if this could work, but yeah, we're not the model. first uh, right. society to, 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 to have this uh, question. Um, yeah, we have to have a more productive we need a productive yeah. democracy. Everybody needs to have the ability to, to contribute. Um, I think Andy's totally right. You know, the whole French strikes was about not raising the retirement age, right? Because young people will not get into the workforce if we people don't retire out. Right. Uh, at some level, you probably 
you may need to lower the retirement age if we really don't need so many workers. And that's a very heretical thing to say, right? Uh, but it may be true. I mean, it just feels like nobody has the answer to that. We deal with these 99ers all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a terrifying situation for people. 52 years old, completely healthy, and it's like, now yeah, what? That's right. But this is the exact reason why we need to have a mandated wealth building right. scheme that lasts your whole lifetime. So the 20 year olds, by the time when they get to 55, 60, or 65, mm -hmm. yeah, have enough that. assets they can annuitize something right. that gives them, you know, even if it's to 100, that yeah, gives yeah. them some base income before they get to Social Security right. and the health care plan that allows them so that people are not just left living with their kids or yep. searching for jobs at 62 years old or 60 year old. So to I mean, me, and, and for this current generation that's in this situation? Yeah, yeah I mean, let's talk about the people. That, there's actually a million people between the ages of uh, 55 and 64. I just wrote a grant proposal for okay. this, so I know. Like 1.3 million who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. And um, in past recessions, half of them would probably have gone into this gentle retirement. They would have had their pensions and a, and a retiree health care system that would bridge into our Social Security age. So let's talk about, you know, the the half million, the 750,000 people who really want to, to work. That's only going to grow, right? It's, um, so I think the German model of, of work sharing is a really good program, but it takes not, companies don't do it. You have to coordinate amongst all employers um, to, um, to do it. And you have to place people who are unemployed in jobs. Yeah. Right. right, right, and then you probably have to really redouble your efforts of fighting age discrimination, um, and that means that older people need to get into training programs and not just welding or something else. They have to people who want to work. I mean, let's just say this. Let's just say all of all of us in this room, people who want to work should be able to work. And if the, we don't have an economy that provides jobs to everybody who wants to work, we have a failed economy. Let's let's let let's let that be our benchmark, not our deficit, not our debt levels, not our tax rate. Let's, let's let be our debt, um, our benchmark. But you're really right, and I'm really glad you're doing this work, that the uh, older unemployed workers are facing problems they never had faced before. It's, it's a really, it's really stunning. Um, I think we're about at the time where we go to audience questions. Um, and my understanding is that we, we have microphones. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Um, this last question and the responses to it both seem to presume that unemployment now is structural. And the empirical evidence is that that simply is not true. Oh, that's not true. It's it is <laughs> not structural. But most it's of the, the, her question presumed that, and most of your answers did. And uh, unemployment is a result now is from a lack of demand. Yeah, oh yes, that's right. Yes, but so all of well, your answers talked about easing people into early retirement. That's, that is not increasing demand. You think all the construction jobs that we lost are coming back? I mean, construction is five percent of the U.S. economy. And, and so there are a lot of. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's what it is. Do you well, think that's, a that's lot of what workers? It, it's a very labor-intensive industry. I that's, mean, yeah, but it doesn't account for anywhere near the total number of people who have been unemployed in the last three years. You can talk about construction. You can talk about the people who used to be sort of the the mortgage dealers across the country. I'm not. I'm, ta real, I'm not talking real like, estate and construction is five percent. Okay, so this that's presumption. That's a lot of workers. It does. I mean, uh, are they all going to become nurses? Like, that, no, that's, that's the industry that's, that's growing. Whole, healthcare. No, that's my whole point. Your answer just there presumes that it is structural. If there was demand, these oh, wait people a second. would I think, not yeah, be unemployed. I, I don't think we disagree much here. I think everybody on the panel realizes that in almost every uh, yeah, occupation industry, there is a lack of jobs for everybody who wants yeah. it. It's not just a mismatch. So like, no, 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 Oh. That's a good point. A good we, point. we should have uh, given a, a fiscal answer as well, not just, you know, sort of little tinkering things. If we had a more robust live, you know, economy, more people would be being hired. You saw it, though, in this, you know, the McDonald's day last week before last, and they hired 62,000 people in one day. Uh, turned McDonald's. down, I think, 50,000. 50,000? Okay. People getting um, turned down for McDonald's jobs. Wow. How many people turned out? Uh, something like 50,000. Whatever it was, was enormous numbers. Uh, they wanted, uh, I they think, ended up hiring 50. They still turned away. Whatever it was, right? People. But we don't just want, uh, you know, McJobs, right? We have to figure out how do we have enough demand. How do, so you're, you're right. 
Uh, so, our bad. <laughs> we should have more demand. Um, how about, yeah, Lucy. Um, I would like to know um, what would be the upside and the downside for putting, having the retirement age somewhat lower. That's, um, um, that has been a provocative suggestion by um, Jamie Galbraith. What that means is that you would just raise benefits for um, people who retired at 62. Right now, you can retire at 62, but you have to take a 75% cut, cut in your Social Security benefits. So he, um, the downside is that it would be very, very expensive. Um, the upside is that you would actually help people who will never be able to find jobs again move from unemployment to retirement. Uh, thank you. Uh, in uh, Catherine's first question, she noted that there was an absence of a corporate presence or corporate voice on this panel. And uh, I'm wondering why that's the case, because I go at, at a lot of panels of this sort, and I, you know, I see uh, C-SPAN panels and all, and very rarely do you see a corporate presence. Is that because the organizers of these panels don't know a good corporate person that shares uh, no, some I, of the views um, expressed here? No, I think actually, no, we, we, we invited lots of, we actually invited about five people to be corporate representatives, and all of them said they're really not re, um, familiar with retirement security, or they had other um, obligations. I think just generally, and corporations have not had a public voice on the retirement crisis or um, low wages. And I really hope that they would come together and realize that they need to solve that problem from a business side and they should have a voice. So we tried to encourage them. We, they, did have a, they did have an open invitation. Tom Mackle and I are in the process right. of creating an organization. Great. With, uh, you, you agree with me, uh, right? Who, right. Uh, want to walk shoulder to shoulder on Absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, hi, thanks. Um, I'm the, among the white collar community who, um, and I wasn't fired or laid off because um, of a lack of work. I was a whistleblower, so my situation's a little different. But I'm also an expert on the financial sector as a bank analyst. So it's, it's, I've taken the responsibility to listen to financial crisis and creek commission hearings and attempt to understand you know, what some of the root problems are with regard to my sector, but they pervade into everybody's life because they're the arteries of the economy. So I, you people are really sincere. I hope you can do the critical thinking. Um, the, we need to pl play a strong defense. And, and, there's, and the double entendre is, is uh, national security production, of which we still have a great deal, is pr still protected by tariffs. However, a great deal of our actual other production has been offshore under the free trade agreements to comply with the G20 agreements, of which the Germans are the biggest What's um, your question? power Sorry. in. Your question? Um, well, um, how, if you're thinking of how to play a good, strong defense, which is the vision thing, and the founders had that with using tariffs. So why are we hurting our economy by um, okay. taking okay. production out of the United States to com suit the Germans in the G20 agreements. Why are we shrinking our economy to suit the G20 agreements? Why are, which is to, in fact to suit the Germans, which have an export driven economy, which think, is why yeah, they can do the sharing that okay. you've talked about. And so why, why if Thanks. we need to play the right defensive vision and get our game plan, are we doing things to self immolate it's a trade, to suit the, the Germans? Um, so, I mean, I think, um, you know, you say the obvious, countries need to trade, yeah. but we're, we're, uh, let, let, how, can, let me, can I at least finish? We're, I understand, so we have a sucker, we are suckers in America because, you know, we have a, our biggest export product should be, for instance, some of our technological innovations, you know, software from Microsoft, and yet, 90, as I said earlier, 90% of all the software used by the Chinese government is pirated. So, you know, obviously if you make agreements that are only enforced by one side, they're, not, they're pretty worthless. And I'd say our relationship, the agreement we made that was the worst agreement we ever entered into was an agreement with China. A, because they don't enforce it. B, they promised they would sign two protocols, one about services and one about procurement policies both of which they've not signed when they entered the WTO. We've done nothing to deal with any of that. Three is they obviously, you know, very thoughtfully and cleverly um, 
steal our technology, not just our software, um, and do technology transfer. And I've used foreign and direct investment to bring people into the country and then actually violate all the free trade rules um, in order to keep their companies to be much more competitive and they manipulate their currency. Now, this is our biggest trading partner. So we're suckers. You know, it, trade will never work if you sign agreements that only one side complies with. And whatever we do with Panama, Colombia, and Korea are important. China is the whole deal, you know, that's really driven the, the most dramatic change in the world. Uh, and I think, you know, we had a pro-company trade policy. I think you're going about to hear people say we need a pro-America trade policy. Okay, how can how can you attain the goals when the ruling cl class puts all the emphasis on on cutting government spending and deficits, which is going to re going to destroy our economy, not create jobs or do anything that you told about when the ruling class and that's all you ever hear on television is we have to cut spending, we have to cut the deficit, no emphasis on creation jobs and. And Mr. Stern, you may feel Paul Ryan is a thoughtful person, but I say he's a Ayn Rand right-wing crackpot who would like to see seniors die quickly. <laughs> well, what do you really think? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. The uh, it is it is a weird moment. It does feel a little bit like the the, the uh, society is committing suicide at some in some way a little bit that. We're, we're about to do things, and uh, Krugman has just been great on this. We're about to do things that we know are going to be detrimental, and we're going to do them anyway uh, because we have to satisfy this, this deficit uh, uh, mania. That said, uh, you know, at some level, we, we, we do need to figure out um, ways to deal with the need for investment. You know, it's, we, don't, we, we don't make... The political system doesn't seem able to deal with these enormous crises we had. But the answer, of course, is politics, right? We, we make change nonviolently via politics, and that's how we will, one of the ways we will solve this. The other way is we will have to, workers will need to organize again so they can demand some of those productivity gains and tell their employers you actually have to be smarter about, about competing. The Democrats the Senate, they, and they did. And yet it's the Republican agenda. It's a little confusing, I agree. Well, I, I would only say that um, having a responsible fiscal plan is not, should be a democratic it always agenda, was. not simply seen as a Republican agenda. And, right. you know, I don't think we should be defending long term deficits. I appreciate in any crisis you have to respond, you know, and I think there are lots of you know, issues that we need to talk about. So I think, you know, I happen to be a fiscal conservative. I do believe in not a balanced budget amendment, but balancing budgets. Mm -hmm. I do believe yeah, sure. in getting rid of things that don't work and replacing them with things that are more future oriented. So I would only say being self-critical, you know, I spent so much time worrying about how we spent money, you know, and helping the government spend it any way I could that I sometimes think, it didn't think enough about sort of how to have a responsible way and progressive way to think about fiscal responsibility. Um, the way economists talk about this is um, sort of an asymmetric effect. Um, and so I actually uh, really agree with you that in a um, recession, it's, um, any recession, but one especially as deep as this one, um, trying to balance budgets now would actually have much worse effect. Um, and so we need to do three things. We um, need to increase unemployment insurance because that will actually cause a little bit of a short-term deficit but aid in growth and actually close the deficits. Um, we actually need to give more money to state and local governments. That will increase the federal deficit but actually may grow in um, more revenue and jobs so that you actually close the deficit. So the, so the magic of macroeconomics is that you actually need to create deficits to close them. Um, and so um, I, I think that that really should be a democratic, to, to speak to your political point, I really agree with Andy, and this is probably why we are, can work together, and my new partner, Dan Cantor, too, that we actually have to advocate deficits now 
but really speak to the responsibility of having long-term budget balances. Right. Uh, what's the role of unions in all of this, especially given if they don't have pensions, what's their, you know, what kind of power can they continue to have without pensions? I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I don't think pensions are the issue. You know, I think you know, unions have gotten to a place in a 20th century model, you know, where we sort of tried to uh, share in success, divide the success, redistribute success on a company-by-company -company basis, and it's not going to work in a global economy in the same way. You're either going to have to play a different role about raising the floor and having unions play different roles in sectors and workplaces than they once played before. We can't continue to, de to defend simply the legacy institutions that exist and miss out on the clean economy and the new growth areas of the economy. So, in, you know, in my framework, in a revolutionary moment, old institutions who cannot adapt like churches, like unions, like social organizations wither, and hopefully new organizations that can adapt. And if you look at the Catholic Church, you know, and you see mega churches and evangelical churches, you know, are two ad adaptive models of a different nature. And I think, you know, unions are in this position. They are going to have to figure out a different role to play in the 21st century because we're not going to go back to having them. We shouldn't go back and are not going to go back to employer-based pensions and health care being the way we provide these things. There are roles for unions in terms of the wage issue, but they're really not company by company as much as they need to be sector by. We don't have to have start a competition between Continental and United Airlines about who can pay the most or pay the least. Yeah. And I think in some countries they actually bargain not at a company basis at all, basis. right? So it's like, th th that's, I think that's the answer at some level. Uh, there may be new forms, new forms of worker association, new, new forms of community association that help try to deal with new mutualism. I actually think this contingent worker problem is a gigantic one, a quarter, apparently, of workers essentially have no employer or, or have so many employers it's the same. Uh, you know, the freelancers union is, I think, in about five years in New York, going to be the biggest union in the state. Uh, and, and it's already got about 90,000 people who are relating to it and has power on some things, not on others, but they're pretty smart and they're very hardworking. You know, we're going to have to figure out new ways of mutually supporting each other, not just the state. Uh, this is a question on the, on the uh, guaranteed retirement accounts. Uh, where do we get the $600 uh, per person per year uh, which I gather would be about sixty to a hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, it's not that. It's not that much. So this is the description <laughs> of the of the account. Um, we have um, a sneaky way to do social policy in this country. We spend a lot of money on social policy, but we do it through the tax code, so that we have a lot of tax deductions for things that we view uh, Congress and the president think are are worthy. We have um, de deductions for. Um, mortgages. You can get a deduction for a million dollar um, mortgage for your um, residence or a second home. Um, um, your contributions to your 401k or your pension plan are also subsidized by the government but through um, the tax code. But since we have a progressive tax system, we um, have a system where if you have a deduction, the people who make the most, who have the highest tax rate, actually get the most government subsidy. Um, and you're hoping that, that they, you incent people through the tax deduction to do the right thing, like say for their retirement. But we have a tax system which actually um, um, incents people at the top rate who really don't need government help or government incentives. So 79% of the government help to accumulate retirement assets go to the top 10% of, mm. of taxpayers. Um, people who make over 60, I mean, sorry, $200,000 per year, who are usually people who will voluntarily save for their retirement and who voluntarily save the maximum for their retirement, get about $7,000 per year for their retirement. But all the research shows they, were, they would save um, anyway without that help. And people who make $20,000 a year, $50,000 a year, get nothing. So I've proposed that we take the tax deduction and turn it into a tax credit 
so that 63 million Americans that don't have anything at all will actually get some um, help to build up what Andy says we need is the retirement assets. Um, and the people who make $200,000 a year, they'll save anyway. We don't take away from, from them. And many more people will have it. So it's revenue neutral. Remember, I cared about the deficit. I do. And I propose that these guaranteed retirement accounts um, be created with no increase in taxes at all. We had a federal surplus not long ago, right? We, we don't need to hold up deficits as some sort of, you know, thing we aspire to. Yeah, right. Right, right. We can actually have a growing economy and a balanced budget. Absolutely. Here, here. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, Andy, you had spoken about the budget committee that you were on, and I would love for you just to talk about the um, Congressional Progressive Caucus budget um, that hasn't been mentioned, and and the other two panelists are, are welcome to speak about it as well. I mean, I think it's probably the mo the Prog Congressional Progressive <laughs> Caucus has put out a, a terrific, I think, budget. I mean, it's not as well, you know, researched as maybe you know I would like it to be to compete. But it, it basically just makes a different series of choices about how we spend our money militarily, about how we use our tax system, of how we deal with tax expenditures and subsidies. And, you know, so A, I think it's great. B, I wish it got more attention. C, I hope they, uh, you know, can find more supporters. And I think, you know, what the Tea Party has deserves the credit for is they are true believers in a series of ideas, and their uncompromising, and I mean uncompromising beliefs, has pulled the discussion in a certain direction. We have always lacked sort of uncompromising believers on our, on my, our side. I mean, they're always trying to be reasonable and responsible, and sometimes I think you make a lot more change if you can build enough of a constituency, and the only people that matter here, you know, are, are the people that vote in Congress in the, in the end, and I think the fact that you have so many per people who are willing to stand behind that budget is, is the right way to have this discussion occur. So I think it's and great. It was a fairly courageous uh, proposal as well. They didn't mm -hmm. just say what some of my friends always say, oh, we just got to tax the rich. They said mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but they also said there actually isn't enough money or you were not going to raise the rates high enough credibly to produce what you need. And they also said, we're, we're actually going to have to tax middle income earners as well, which is politically a very uh, difficult thing to, to do, um, but probably essential. And just one more question. Who gets the Lauren final get, question? Lauren gets to choose. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, where's the, where's the one? Okay. Well, we'll see. I don't know if it'll be worth it. Um, <laughs> a lot of sure. pressure now. <laughs> what a so, great question. Yeah. <laughs> In a, How was your childhood? That's, <laughs> always a, that's a good one to end with. <laughs> we often hear the phrase, uh, think global, act local. And I sometimes wonder in labor if we need to be thinking globally and also acting globally. So what ways can we take the issues of labor, retirement security, and things like that and scale them up to a, a global scale? So, so I'd say, I used to say, um, and still do, that Workers of the World Unite used to be an ideological statement. It's just now a fact of life. You know, that we have global trade, global companies, global finance. Why in the world we don't have global unions, I don't get at all. And the fact that we could have BMW, you know, a German company be 100% union in Germany and non-union in South Carolina is just... Uh, it is incredibly infuriating, both in terms of our, meaning the American <coughs> Union's inability to appreciate the, what the unity would mean with the German unions and the German Union's unwillingness to sort of recognize what it would be if all the workers were in the same yeah. union. And so, you know, if you have global companies, you need global unions. And actually, you know, we had a number of instances where, you know, you, you can use the advantage of being in a global union because everyone big different strengths. So in a, one of our major campaigns against the security employer, the fact of what they did to those workers in Africa who worked for the same company 
you know, who, who took care of buildings here in New York City, was way more of an embarrassment to drive their behavior differently mm -hmm. than just coming and saying, well, the American workers don't have health care. It's a lot different to say the African workers don't get overtime. In fact, in that campaign, that we found that the more hours you work, the less you made, because they were you were privileged to get more hours, so you should work the, le the more hours at a lower rate as opposed to getting double time or time and a half. So, and we paid for workers in India to go on strike for two months, which cost absolutely nothing, rather than American workers going on strike, which would have cost an absolute fortune. So there's a lot of advantages strategically that you could use, you know, so you outsource the strike. Outsource the strike. Oh, that's so incredible. You follow, you follow them. All that is brilliant. Yeah. Yep. So, that. so it just seems to me the basic law of economics always work, which is you you want to have the greatest impact amongst you know the great at the highest level of decision making you possibly can. And so, to me, in the multinational world, you know, it is crazy that we don't have global unions. The, the only thing I would add, and I'll, it, it, it's not, I don't know how you do that. I mean, it's we need to do that. Obviously, there needs to be, uh, there are international uh, uh, ways to organize. Uh, but in general, I would say the answer is the labor movement and its allies uh, need to do what they always done. They need to build power. You know, you need to use that power to inject new ideas into the public debate. You need to win elections based on those ideas. You need to then see if your ideas were in fact true. Because uh, sometimes we're not we're not correct, and then you need to adjust, and then you need to do it again, right? It's like this work doesn't end. It's intellectual work. It's organizing work. It's it's in one country, in one state, and one world. Before we leave, you know, I just want to say for the Working Families Party, and this is a perfect example of where innovation, you know, despite many odds of people saying we should all be Democrats, you know, why would we have another party? It's really going to hurt us. I think the Working Family Party has proven, you know, that there are different ways to reach the same goals that can be incredibly successful as much as many people try to kill it off because it doesn't serve the conventional, you know, interest and wisdom well. And I would just say this country always does better, Democrats, Republicans, when we encourage innovation and new ideas rather than squelch it because it doesn't sort of meet our politically correct mm. needs at times. And I, I give Danny and what the, he's done and built here an enormous amount of credit. And it's only a shame that people around the rest of the country don't kind of get it. <laughs> I have on the schedule that Teresa's supposed to give. Okay, Teresa, do you want to yeah. finish up? Um, um, in closing, I would like to um, thank my partner, a Andrew White, from the New York um, Center for City of... Sorry, the center, yeah, that's the first thing you're supposed to do if you have a partner is know their name, right? Um, and that we hope to do, do, to do more um, later. And I really appreciate you for, for all coming, and I hope you keep in touch with what our center does. And thank you for all my friends and the members of the new school who came tonight also in support. So thank you very much. <laughs>